all of them like frothing at the mouth, falling over, protect, you know, imagining that they're having like exorcisms. But the exorcist closes the door behind me and he's got five of his mates in there. It was a very scary situation for you. His entourage had blocked our access. And he just comes up to me like he's in a movie and he goes, uh, he's having a go at me about the Falklands. Andrew, how are you good, sir? I am very well, thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me on the show. Hey, it's my absolute pleasure. I um, just first off, it's wonderful to be chatting to another podcaster, not just another podcaster, but someone who's um, mastering the podcast game. I know that from what from what we've chatted before that your audio podcast is is really, really getting high figures, Andrew, but also that Sean, uh, Sean Atwood, who Sean and I have known each other for, gosh, I think three three years now, um, and been on each other's podcasts quite a few times, that he's asked you to co-host for him, which is, that, that that's elevating you to podcast royalty. <laughs> Yeah, it's been really, really nice, actually. Well, Sean first came on my so my podcast called is called On the Edge with Andrew Gold. On the Edge because I talk to all sorts of fringe people, from psychopaths and murderers to a woman who remembers everything since she was born. She got this memory, and uh, a man who survived a plane crash and had to eat his friends, like really fringe stuff. But also people like Richard Dawkins and John Ronson. Anyway, so that podcast I had Sean Atwood on because he was a perfect guest for on the edge fringe things you know with his true crime true, true crime background and uh he was a smuggler and all that kind of thing in the states and went to prison so he came on and we got on really really well and then his producer ash got in touch just a bit ago sean was a bit under the weather and said can you take hold of you know the fort for a little bit um on youtube so you know i've been presenting and doing journalism for years and years and i thought okay yeah why not i've not really done this as a youtube live stream um and i started doing it and it's been brilliant because i had left my own youtube a bit behind so i had the audio podcast on the edge with andrew gold doing really really well getting in all the top rankings and i didn't really bother with youtube so my early episodes on youtube i didn't even have the video it was just audio which is you know useless for youtube now now it's all the video and everything but that meant that I hardly got any views. But then doing co-hosting for Sean, an extra thousand or so subscribers have come over so far and more and more are coming every day. So I've started to take it more seriously. I've just bought a posh camera, like a, you know, it's cost all my money I've got to get that it's going to arrive later. Really excited Which one did, that. did you buy one of these? If I call it a regular camera, you know, you know what I mm. mean? It's a mirrorless camera, which is like the next stage beyond... DSLR cameras. It's uh, I, I'm reluctant to say because I wanted them to give me a free one and they didn't. I got this microphone free from Shure, so I don't mind saying that. But I don't. Whatever. It was a Sony A6400, which is it's the one that a lot of YouTubers are getting. Um, it's just that getting it secondhand. That was seven hundred quid just secondhand, and then a lens. You've got to get a lens. I was told to get the Sigma. Uh, 16 millimeter 1.4 frame or something the lens you pop on it that's 250 quid and then there's all sorts of bits and pieces you need for to, to be able to use it as a webcam so it's ended up costing me like 1200 quid which for me is quite a lot of money to be to be honest uh, but let's see the results it should be arriving later today actually unfortunately i didn't have it ready in time for this but it's coming soon and i'm going to start taking youtube very seriously so yeah i'm hoping that more, more and more people come over and take a look at On the Edge with Andrew Gold on, on YouTube. Yes, it's a, I'll tell you a funny thing, Andrew, mm. is I'm better doing live shows on YouTube than I am mm. pre-recorded. Mm. Spontaneous. I, well, it's more that for, I, I like to be, per, I don't want to say performing, that sounds a bit prissy, I don't mean it like that, but when you've got 
a live chat going on there and people, Hey, Chris, and, and you've got half an eye oh, yeah. on that. And you've got the other, your other eye on your other, your, your screen with the internet up and you've got some videos and stuff there that you're chatting about. And it's like, you have to be on your A game. Yeah. You know, you have to be on your A game. Occasionally there's a little glitch, but that's okay. Whereas if I just sit here and try and pre-record all that, I feel a bit silly, a guy in a room talking to himself. Oh, right. But you're talking to me. I'm here. Yeah. I mean, this is obviously, we're, we're, this is a, 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 a podcast, but what I mean is the big thing about YouTube is you, you have the ability to go live, don't you? Which is you, unique in podcasting yeah. because if I say want to do a reaction video and I want to talk about, hey, Bill Gates has just given, you know, he's just been on holiday with Tony Blair <laughs> and mm. I want to comment on that. It, if I try and do that pre-recorded and I'm sitting here, it feels weird just sat talking to myself in a room with a record sure. button on. But if I, I do exactly that with an mean. audience, albeit mm. an audience I can't see, I can just see their avatars when that those that, that, that are in the live chat, it, it does something. It, it, yeah. it, it makes you play your A game. And, but the problem is, YouTube had just demonetize demonetize almost every live video that I do. Oh. And then you have to appeal it and wait two weeks for them to review it and go, oh yeah, actually, sorry, you know, when you said, I don't know, you know, white stuff, you were talking about snow. YouTube, the YouTube algorithm or software thought you were talking about the other mm. the other white stuff, right? It's a shame, isn't it? And of course, by the time that two weeks has gone. No, you've lost all, all your views. Everyone's watched it in that two weeks. You might get a trickle of views after. So 100%. all of that advertising has gone, gone to YouTube. So, Yeah. Yes. Well, I'd say a couple of things about that. I think, firstly, I totally agree. It's, it's a massive shame, and I'm not sure how we get around it because at the end of the day, you, YouTube is paid for by its advertisers, and the advertisers, they, should, they get to decide what they pay for. Right, that's how it works. But that the way it worked on TV wasn't like that. It was more like the advertisers were like, right, there's a there's a free space here. We'll put our advert in it, and nobody then, if if the the video, if the documentary, say, or the movie was about a very controversial subject, the advertiser wasn't linked to it in the break. Right, so it's like it could be something very controversial about you know the white stuff, let's say that you're referring to. Uh, then there's a break, and you see. I don't know, Dan on yogurts or whatever. Nobody's thinking the yogurts are related to the white stuff. But I, this is the problem with YouTube. It, it does get linked and the advertisers don't want that. So I understand it from that perspective. But the dangerous thing is it now means that we are encouraged as creators to be as bland as possible, never to question the narrative. And that's where more and more people are getting with their information. I don't watch TV. We all watch YouTube, and it means we can't say what we want to say. So it, it and it means entertainment's getting blander and blander, and the truth is getting more and more obscured, and different views are being obscured. It's very dangerous, and I don't know what the answer is because I respect that advertisers don't want to put their names on stuff that's controversial, but I'm worried about what that means mm. for us as content makers. And you know, I think for the record, Andrew, I think it's also a bit deeper than that. I think that you'll find that these advertisers are part of some sort of conglomerate, if that's the right word, a, mm -hmm. a, collect, a collective. Sure, sure. I think you'll find the collectives controlled by BlackRock who own leading shares in everything. And as the leading shareholder, they'll say to YouTube, we don't want, we're not going to sponsor these videos. We're not, it's nothing to do with the fact that the companies don't, because Coca-Cola doesn't care if, you know, if a video, and let's just say uh, we, we, we talk, let's just say it's about uh, adults that have been uh, improprietous with, with young people, right? Try not, try not to say the, the key words here, folks, right? Yeah. But, you know, a very incredibly con uh, emotive subject, yeah. right? Coca-Cola doesn't care if there's a Coke advert in the middle of that because – if that video is, say, on someone like Sean's show and it's going to get 300,000 views, yeah, that's 300,000 people that might 
go, oh, do you know what? I just fancy a Coca-Cola. I mean, that's that's what advertising is. Yeah. So I think it's deeper and darker than 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 companies don't. No, you're right. Sort of, you know, I think you're it's not being just, paid by Coke, are you, Chris? Um, I would just like to say that <laughs> in the morning I <laughs> slap Bulldog on my face because I've Bulldog got that. It is the mo- moisturizing cream for men. I mean, yeah. real men. Look at that. Yeah. See. I've got that one. Do I have to do a disclaimer now that I'm not getting paid by Bulldog? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe. There it is. <laughs> yes. This is what I love about podcasts and is is um you can have the is you can have this the, the this banter, whereas with the old school broadcast it was right. Sure. You're coming on at this time, we'll give you three minutes notice. And you're going to talk for 20 seconds and that's it. Yeah. 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 Well, look, that's the other reason that I think you enjoy doing your live streams because you've got a big following. So you feel, you can feel like you're not talking to an empty room. And I thought about that the other day, that would be nice, but I don't yet have that YouTube following. So I would still be talking to an empty room or something even more awkward. There might be one or two people there just watching me, the only people in the room, which is a bit awkward. So you've got to get to that point. What I'd say there is, if you're not playing the YouTube algorithm, i.e., you know, no one's going to want to watch anyone talk if they're talking about a baked bean can or, or you know, what, 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 what they have for breakfast. It, but if you can hit that subject that triggers people, then you just repeat, repeat, repeat. And the snowball effect um, – that's that's what works really well on YouTube. Whereas the audio podcast, it's different. The audio, mm. or you know, on audio, you got people that just really want to listen to something. Let's just say a bit intellectual while they're doing their, you know, they're mm. doing a boring job or they're driving yeah. to work in the morning or or they're lying in bed mix, on us. Mix it up on yeah. the audio. I I purposely uh, think okay, well, I had a psychopath last week. So this week I want to have a former Scientologist, you know, whereas as you're, what you're saying, I think is right with YouTube. It's like, I know that my psychopath ones have done really well. So I should just keep interviewing psychopaths and keep going with that. But I want to mix it up. So it all just takes time. I'm excited about it all. But, you know, yeah, oh, I'm excited. It's getting there. It's getting there. Yeah. So if you found that your psychopath podcast did really well, Mm-hmm. What you then do is you do some live shows and get some some video up that you can get on the screen, and you say, and you put your thumbnail out. Uh, today, Andrew's chatting about what makes a psychopath. Tomorrow, or, or three days sure. later, you do one world's most famous psychopaths. Three days later, why are psychopaths so? Why is it they seem to be so prevalent at this moment in time? Yeah. And having said that, what do you think? I, I say it's because I think, Andrew, back in the days of community, hmm. if you had a psychopath in your community and people started to realize they're using their devious ways to control people, mm-hmm. they would have branded them like a wizard or a witch and they'd cast them out the village. And then they'd, you know, wander from town to town and probably die in a ditch or something. Now we're living in this world where everyone lives in their home bubble. You communicate over the internet. You don't actually like go and see anyone anymore. Um, you even work from home, which is, uh, you know, <clears throat> cough, cough, uh, a, 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 a byproduct of what's, of, of mm-hmm. what's been going on for the last two years. And so psychopaths can very well operate with, without anyone knowing that who, who they are. Um, mm. do you have any kind of view view on that or, or yeah. in a, in an office environment, you can be like a psychopath in the office and then mm. you can go home and no one, no one knows you. And, and, and I work, I used to work with a guy like this and when he was outed, it was really weird because to me, he was a really good guy and I got on really well. Yeah. And then people said, no, Chris, he, he liked you and he played you as his like trump card against mm. everybody else. 
But the stuff he was doing, say, to some of the young women in, in the office was just basically bullying them. Ah. Um, yeah. Well, I think like, your first point about why it feels like there's more psychopaths, in, in a sense, now, I think is more just an awareness. So I think there's 1% of the world um, are thought to be psychopaths. Um, so, the, I mean, the first thing to say is that, I mean, it's a spectrum. I don't think it's as simple as this. Per we like to believe that, don't we, from movies and things. This person's a psychopath. This person is not. That's an empath. I think it's a lot more complicated than that in reality, and there are different aspects to what makes a psychopath. You can get all different kinds of ones, but the, the general uh, common denominator is a lack of empathy. They're not able to empathize. It doesn't mean they want to go around uh, killing people. They generally don't. It wouldn't be good for them because they'd be going to prison. So what's the point? Um, a lot of them don't get much enjoyment from killing. What's, why would you do that? But they're just not that bothered about your problems. Now, you, you, might, you might know loads of people who are just not that empathetic. So at what point do you call them psychopaths? And general, generally, there's, a, there's a, the hair test. It was called H-A-R-E, um, and the checklist. So you score yourself. There's like 20 questions, things like, uh, are, do you have grand illusions? Do, or do you think you're better? You know, loads of things about that. And if you score over 30 out of 40, you're considered a psychopath. I think in the UK and America, it's different. Like in one of the countries, if you score over 20, you're a psychopath. So most of us probably score somewhere between 5 and 15 on that list. Um, and you might change over the years because empathy can be taught. So that's an interesting thing as well. Like, are you a psychopath for life? Can you be taught some form of empathy, at least in the early years? So I think movies and books about psychopaths have made them seem more prevalent, but they've always been there. Um, and then there are different types of psychopaths as well. You talk about manipulating and how we might try and manipulate people. I had a, a professor of linguistics on um, a few months ago, which sounds rather boring. I'm a bit of a linguist myself. I speak five languages. I'm really into languages. Can I just stuff. interrupt and say mm. that would be my ideal podcast? Ah. I, well, I've written six books. I love language. My oh, brother, really? my brother Pat got an honours degree in linguistics cool what and as he was studying he's just giving me these little tidbits all the time of well this chris you can see this mechanism here in speech performs yeah. this function and i oh, just absolutely fascinating ab absolutely loved it well the two people i've had on about linguistics one was john mcwater who's quite a famous outspoken sort of anti-woke kind of guy and he talks about the origins of swear words and things like that um, and then the other person was Professor Lyra Boroditsky, and she's just amazing, fascinating woman. And she talked a lot about uh, whether languages that we learn can change the abilities we have in our brains. So there's a tribe in Australia that she went to visit that are able to use directions in terms of north, west, south, and east. They don't use right and left. So they say, oh, yeah, that's just the east of you. Now, if you think about how crazy that is, because if you turn around, it's it's still east over there and it's still west. And so they have compass points in their brains because of a different language they spoke. So she talks about that. But one interesting thing she said was language is manipulation. Why, what is language? Why do, we, <clears throat> why do we need language? You need to be able to manipulate your mother to feed you. You need to be able to manipulate people. And on a basic level, that's no bad thing, right? We do it to cooperate and we use it in good ways. But I would say we are all manipulating one another even in a tiny form or in a huge way like psychopaths might do. So then there are three main ways of manipulating uh, because we want status in our lives. So I had a guy called Will Storr on the podcast who talks about the status game. And all of us want status. That's what we all need. The reason we want status is because if you were in a tribe many, many years ago, we had 200,000 years or 300,000 as like hunter-gatherers, right? That's a long time for our brains to evolve to fit the tribal way of living. Um, when we were in tribes, if you had a good status, you would get more of the food. And there are three ways to do that. One is success. So you can be successful by building the wheel, right? Inventing the wheel. And everyone's going to be like, oh, have some of our food. You can eat tonight. You built the wheel with us. So if you're very successful in life, it gives you status. It feels good. Um, another way is dominance, right? That's where you get that alpha male, but you can get alpha females, of course, as well. People who just bully and those are probably the psychopaths you might be talking about. You know, they they push them that that kind of very obvious way. If you bully people, you'll get more of that food. You know, you're like people will be scared not to give it to you. 
The third type is the most interesting to me, and that's virtue. Um, and what that means is like you appear to your tribe to be the nicest person. Everyone wants to share their food with you because you helped everyone. You did a nice thing. But the interesting thing is there that it's not the person who is the most virtuous who gets the most food. It's the person who is able to convince others that they are the most virtuous. So if you're somebody who's very good at making it look like you're a nice person, you'll get more food. So psychopaths might operate in any of those three ways. They might try to be as successful as possible. They might try to dominate people, but they might also do a lot of virtue signaling. Um, there is thought to be a much higher ratio of psychopaths among those who virtue signal, which is, you know, on Twitter saying, saying like they believe in a lot of causes and things and they want to help. What they're really doing is signaling to you, they want you to share their, your food with them. That's what that is. So there are so, so many different ways a psychopath might act that it's just fascinating. You never know. And the spectrum thing's interesting, doesn't it? Because as a podcaster, you know, you got this, uh, you got this dimension of your personality that's online, mm -hmm. and it's a completely different. It, well, it, it, gosh, I'm I'm struggling for the words. You've is it completely different to your personal personality? Because mm -hmm. uh, obviously. When you're online, you try to be a nice person because otherwise people aren't going to watch you. Yeah. But then you you turn this camera off and this microphone and then go and shout at the missus. <laughs> and, <laughs> and oh yeah. Go you know, have I done that? Yes, of course I have. I'm I'm human. I I I can be absolute dickhead. Um mm. but but yeah, it is funny. You can really craft a personality yeah. of a virtue signaling you know oh look at that oh isn't it terror and all you're doing is play into people's you know they're going to hit the like button if they think that you're a guy like you share the same i mean it, it, it's interesting isn't it that mm. well yeah this is something they call parasocial interaction and it was sort of started in the 1950s with talk show hosts um it was the first time probably ever maybe radio host before that where you had what would normally be a two-way conversation but was just one way this was a new thing after 300,000 years of evolution of man well we've been evolving for longer than that but 300 years as 300,000 years as, as humans um it's the first time we've really had anything like that a, a one-way communication that will forever stay one way and the best hosts were good at something called parasocial interaction which is this ability to make the person watching them feel as though um as it's a, it's a two-way conversation feel as though they are friends with the host uh, and that became this really fascinating phenomenon and it's why we love celebrities and we feel like they're our friends if leonardo dicaprio suddenly walked in my brain wouldn't fully understand because it would look like it's a mate of mine. And I'd go, oh, hi, Leo. And then I'd have to remind myself, he doesn't know who I am. He's never seen me, but he seems like my mate. And the talk show hosts, of course, they're even better at this. And people who are good at podcasting also tend to be good at cultivating this kind of parasocial interaction. It's what you and I do. Um, and it doesn't mean we're faking things. It doesn't mean that necessarily, but somebody could do that. So that's the that's the interesting thing there. And and that's why YouTubers are always, always, and particularly the young ones, talking about the word authenticity. They're saying, I'm so authentic, and they'll get into YouTube wars with other YouTubers and say, Oh, he's fake, he's inauthentic, because authenticity is the thing that everybody is after. Because where do we get it? Everything in our lives seems so fake these days. Everything is planned and acted. So when you find somebody online who you relate to and you go, that person's being real, that's like, you know, a diamond. You know, that's 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 a gem. You you want to keep that, you want to keep that relationship. But it can be cultivated for example, by psychopaths, by people who are very good at manipulating people who are in real life, like you say, you know, you know what I mean. Yes, just a tip for you. If Leo mm. Leonardo does come into your place, yeah. watch the fridge because he will just, he'll clear out your fridge, mate. Yeah. And, um, Andrew, yeah, I'm glad you said that last bit because it's just remind me I'm not as psychopathic as I probably am <laughs> now sat here thinking that I am yeah. simply because I have some simple philosophies for life 
and and I think it all, all born off the back of having some quite severe challenges at times and not wanting to have them again. Mm-hmm. Um, and authentic. So I am authentic in that I want other people to understand there's so much lies and bullshit in society. And if you buy into that crap, you're just going to have a really challenging, you know, life is just so, so simple. Get up, love yourself, smile at the sun to say thank you, you know, to Mm. express gratitude for this one chance you get in this cluster of molecules, right? Is love yourself a euphemism? (laughs) Hey, you know, in whatever form that takes, folks. (laughs) And, And it really is that simple. You jog around the block. Why? Because as hunter-gatherers, it's not natural to be sat in front of this bloody thing all day. Like sure. it's just not. If you don't get some air in your lungs, you're not you're not living in tune with this. You say three hundred thousand years, Andrew. I I think we've been lied to. There. I think it could could be significantly longer. If you think that Jesus lived two thousand years ago, mm. and probably look no different to what I look now, and then. Anyway, that's probably n- another subject. But, um, you know, again, hunter-gatherers, I'm really big on, on, on diet because you've got to keep your body in the pH. Uh, yeah. The pH, uh, sorry, folks, seven, 7.25, which is what nature intended and which is what Western toxic diet, I say Western, it's, we should call it global toxic diet now mm. takes you so far away from that. Hence why so many people suffer so much ill health throughout the year, you know, all these coughs, colds and flu, and they, they then blame it on somebody. So they go their whole life thinking a cold is something you catch off somebody else. Um, and so I'm authentic there. And I'm just telling you, people what i've learned in 52 years and what really really works that's what it's about man you know the importance of when you're in a in a challenging situation you've got to take action when you're depressed anxious you know up against it at work whatever you've got to take action you've got to make that phone call to your boss and say look i'm sorry i quit or you've got to speak to that person you've fallen out with and say look we, we we got We've got to get some resolution here. Or you've actually got to get to B&Q, buy the paint that you said you're going to paint the fence. And, the, you know, and off the back of that simple thing, buying that paint, mm-hmm. your cosmic karmic payback, <laughs> just it just goes up tenfold. Um, yeah. It's like Jordan Peterson. That's what he says, make your bed. Yeah, exactly. If you make your bed in the morning, when you literally look backwards and you go, oh, my bed's all... It, You've won the day already mm. just by something that is so simple that says so much about how you, the respect you've got for yourself and that you want to get your day in order right from the beginning. Um, gosh, I don't know where we go next. Cause you, you've, you, you have fascinating knowledge, Andrew, in so many areas. Should we take the exorcism thing? Sure, sure. So yeah, that was um documentary I made for yeah, not for the BBC because I made it myself and then sold it to them after. But I went I was living in Argentina and I saw on TV all the time there was this fella, this exorcist who was saying that he could cure people of all sorts of diseases. And yeah, out in the sticks, out in the suburbs of Buenos Aires, that's where he was operating. I got in touch with him and said I'd like to go and sort of follow you around for the next you know, a couple of months. Um, my friend David is a director and he was out in Argentina at the same time as me. So the two of us were like, okay, let's go do this out in the middle of nowhere. So we got, we went and watched exorcisms and I got to even take part in one. Um, I was the guy ringing the bells. The bells are supposed to stave off the devil. So I would sort of kneel over this young woman who was 17. Well, that wasn't the first one. The first one was Natalia, who she was like 30 odd. And she was saying she was suffering with urges and pushes and uh, intrusive thoughts and things that we might recognize as schizophrenia or obsessive compulsive disorder. But for her, because she was out in this place that lacked education and significant mental health awareness, she uh, thought it was a demon inside her. So she gets down on the floor 
the priest starts or the, the exorcist starts, you know, shouting, the power of God compels you, the power of Christ compels you, all this stuff over and over again. And, you know, 20, 30 minutes later, she's like going berserk, limbs flailing everywhere. I'm standing over her ringing bells. Uh, and you can find this, by the way, you know, if you're in England on iPlayer, or but if not, it's on YouTube, just type exorcism. Andrew Gold or whatever you'll find this film is still out there on, on the BBC's page. Um, I'm standing over looking like a right dork, just sort of waving these bells. And she's just screaming and shaking and shouting things. The thing is, I don't believe in any of that stuff um, personally. And I've, I respect people's you know beliefs. They're allowed to believe whatever they want. I don't mind, but I don't. And I thought, it's amazing what's happening to her mind here because it's this placebo effect and suggestion and she's basically being hypnotized. So afterwards, like a minute after, the priest is like, how, do you, how are you feeling? And he's like sweating because he's been like, you know, going around the room shouting and like a maniac. She's like in a right state. You know, she looks like she's just given birth and she's like, I'm cured. I'm cured. I know it. And that happens two or three times when I attended exorcisms. They were like straight away afterwards, I'm cured. Thing is, I went back a year later and they were like, nah, I've still got the same problems because they had very real mental health problems. They can't just be cured from an exorcism. But what's amazing, what I learned there, because I didn't want to make a documentary of like, oh, I don't believe in this stuff and I was right and nothing helped, right? What was interesting to me was I went in thinking this is all a bunch of nonsense, but then these people did get better. They did get better, and not just for a day. I'm talking six to 12 months. They felt better. And that's amazing what ex your, your own expectations and the placebo can do to you. Just that big sort of one-hour-long powerful moment of an exorcism, and these people felt amazing for six to 12 months. So in that respect, you could say it doesn't really matter if it's real, if there are really demons or not, because they got better. The problem is, long-term, they didn't get better, and that's where we were. But... This exorcist, he was selling things as well to these. These are quite impoverished, you know, people. These are people in, a, in an area that where they can't afford much. And he's selling them like a tiny bit of oil for like, you know, $20, which for, for them is a lot of money, uh, that he says can cure breast cancer or whatever. And it's like, if they think that and they're not going to the doctor, you know, it's really, really dangerous. Anyway, over the weeks, I hung around with him, uh, did his exorcisms with him. But gradually, I started asking a few questions about one of the young women that is like his assistant. And he had exercised her. That's how he met her. And it seemed like they lived together. She was like 20 by this point, and he's like 55. Seemed like they lived together upstairs in the church. And it was all just a bit dodgy. So I started just asking a few people around the church, hey, what's the deal with this? What's going on? You know? And everyone was a bit like, oh, I don't know, don't know. Anyway, word got back to him that I'd been asking about his relationship with this woman. And he suddenly, I didn't know that he knew this. And he suddenly goes, Andrew, can you just uh, come back here, right? This was when he had a big mass going on. There were like 20,000 people in his church and outside around the streets, all of them like frothing at the mouth, falling over, protect, you know, imagining that they're having like exorcisms. It was like a most, the most mad thing. And they're all waiting for him to come out on the stage. And he just goes like, before coming out on the stage and doing his mass, it's at night, midnight or something, in the middle of nowhere outside Buenos Aires, he just goes, Andrew, come back here a minute. So I go back there with David, my director, and he goes, this is just between me and Andrew, so you stay outside here. And my mate David's like, well, hang on, what, what's the, let me in, Can't you, what are you talking about? And he's like, no, you stay here. And so David's outside holding the camera, and then the guy, the exorcist, closes the door behind me, and he's got five of his mates in there. Quite big, burly blokes. Some of them. I've heard. Like, I've. I've. I've heard this. Yeah, go. Go on. I'm, yeah, it, it was a very scary situation for you. Oh my god! They had uh, one of the guys got this big staff. You know, like Jafar and Aladdin. He's like holding his staff, and like they were very imposing. And at that point, I'm thinking, you know what? Nobody knows where I am because I didn't do this with the BBC. I made this by myself with David, who's David is not an imposing fella. He's a very skinny, short guy. And I've never been in a fight in my life, 
right? I'm very far from your background, for example. I've never done, uh, I wouldn't know military or anything if it hit me on the head, you know? Uh, I've had quite a sheltered life in that respect. Um, and I, I have a lot of respect for people like you who can do what you do, you know? I, I'm so relieved there are people in society who do those, who are, who are willing to do that part. Um, but I'm scared out of my mind at this point and I'm in a little room. He's closed the door. It's a tiny little room and there's five of them. And I'm like, what, what's going on here? No one knows where we are. Middle of nowhere outside Buenos Aires, midnight. He's got a baying crowd of like 20,000 people outside who, if he says to them, you know, tear him limb from limb, they'll do it. Um, really scary situation. And he just comes up to me like he's in a movie and he goes, what have you been telling everyone about my relationship with Paula, which is the woman who he's exercised, who's like 20 and he's hanging around with a lot. And I was like, oh, oh, nothing, nothing. I've just been asking, uh, you know, normal questions. I don't know, what you, don't know what you're talking about. And this is all getting picked up on my microphone, which is on my collar at that point. And I didn't, I'm not even thinking about that at that point. I'm just thinking I need to get the hell out of here. So, and David's trying to get in the door. I can hear him outside and he's being restrained. And this is like, Oh my God, what's going on here? And he starts screaming at me, the exorcist, right? And he's making himself late for the mass outside, but he's just screaming and he's going, you've told everyone that I kiss her on the lips. And I was like, I did, because I didn't say, I never said anything like that. What had happened is there's another journalist who's his best mate, who like re reports and all his demon stuff for the newspaper out there. And he'd gotten jealous that me and David were like, doing another journalism thing there. So he'd gone and told the exorcist that I was asking why he kisses her on the mouth because he had probably seen that. So I was like, I, I didn't even know you did kiss her on the mouth. I do you, I don't know. Like, I don't know any, anything. I didn't ask that. He's screaming and screaming. And eventually David sort of, you know, almost breaks the door in. We were in, I was in there an hour being shouted at and I thought they're going to do away with me. Uh, he's having a go at me about the Falklands. He's going like, you know, English, you took the Falklands as well. And I was like, I don't know what that's got to do with the price of eggs. But then outside, he's screaming more. He screams at David and he's going, I'm a bishop. Give me some respects. Uh, and eventually, like, he's got people in his ear going like, look, just let, let them go sort of thing. But it took a good hour until that point happened. And we were able to get out. But that took then another half hour of David and I, because at this point, like the crowd outside have gotten themselves so worked up, all frothing at the mouth. They're on the floor. They're lying on top of each other in all the corridors of the church. It's just bodies after bodies everywhere. And David and I are trying to like climb on top of them to get outside, hoping that at no point the priest just suddenly goes, you know what, all of you get those guys. You know, we're like, just get out of here. So we get out. We're now in a crowd of thousands of them. They're all like they're all like on the floor going berserk. We're looking for like a taxi in the middle of nowhere at midnight, which is like almost impossible. And then David turns to me and goes, Mate, you know what? I didn't get I didn't get the filming of you leaving the church. And I was like, Right, well, we're just gonna have to do without it. And he goes, No, we have to go back in and we're gonna have to film you leaving again. And I was like, mate, nah, 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 no way. And eventually we did. So he's now at this point, the exorcist, he's up on the stage and I can hear him shouting, the devil has been in this house tonight and blah, 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 all stuff about us. Meanwhile, he doesn't know right next to him, like we're sort of creeping through this aisle in the church over bodies and stuff, hoping no one realizes he's talking about us to go back to where we were so that David can then film me walking out again. And it was the scariest thing for me and the most ridiculous thing ever. Anyway, we got out and I was, my legs turned to jelly, which I thought it's not a very good, you know, flight off fright thing. You know, I can't run. If it's a lion, legs were just shaking and we got home eventually. It was only when we got home, we thought, you know what? We've got a hell of a documentary here. Like the BBC might actually buy this because we never thought they actually would, you know, we just went and made it. They might actually buy this because yeah, we've got all the exorcism stuff, but so do other people. You've seen that on Vice, but nobody's got a priest going bonkers screaming at some English guys about the Falklands and threatening to kill him and all that stuff. So, you know, and then we got pictures and stuff on his Facebook of him on these holidays with this young girl as well, which we end the documentary with. So it was like, you know, we know what, we, what you were doing, mate, you know? I did picture you as the guy that's kicked off all the Falkland shit, mate. <laughs> <laughs> hold, it was my fault. Hold you responsible for what is it? 400 years, <laughs> of, 400 years of history. Yeah, I know, I know. Yes. I know. Madness.
I know that feeling when it all goes wrong. I've I've had it a few times in my life. Um, mm. I got we got mugged me and my mate Simo in in Istanbul by the Turkish mafia one time, and that that actually did get violent. Got my head smashed against the wall ten times. Oh, Jesus. Um, but it was that moment where there's two of you and there's 10 of them. And no matter how hard or military you think you are, you, they're just going to shove a knife in you and not, not even think about it. Yeah. Um, and there was another time in the South American jungle, I got kidnapped, al- albeit kidnapped by the same people I was getting a lift with, if that <laughs> makes sense in any way. And, um, this guy pulled out a blade on me in the middle of the jungle and in the only lights were the car's headlights. And yeah, in those moments, you, it, it's, it's like a switch, isn't it? Things go from, yeah. Oh, it was actually perfectly all right a second ago. And now I think I am going to die. Yeah, um, yeah. It's the adrenaline. But it's also, it, you know, I can understand why some people do become adrenaline junkies because at the, at the time it was horrible. But but looking back now, I'm happy it happened. And it's like, oh, that was quite a moment. Not often that you become that in touch with the, your animal self and you start to really, like you say, your, your, your eyes will look around the room almost like you're an animal. That's how I felt. I, I'm suddenly taking in things in a very different way. I'm acting on instinct a little bit more. Uh, and I suppose it's similar to that feeling if you go you know, hang gliding or jump out of plane. And that's what you're getting in that adrenaline. You're getting closer to your primal self, maybe. Yes. And talking about life and death, Mm. is it Coche? Mm, Inciate. Inciate? Yeah. Well, that was probably my favorite episode on my on the edge with Andrew Gold podcast. Um, and, and unfortunately on the YouTube version, I've only got five minutes of it, like a little clip because uh, he's, he's a bit of an old fella now and it was difficult to do the whole video, but the audio version of the podcast, so I know people here are on, mostly on YouTube and stuff, but I'd encourage you to go and listen to that if it's one thing you listen to just on the audio. Um, and that, yeah, he, he was one of the guys in, oh, he was from uh, Uruguay. They were a rugby team. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people know the story. There was the movie Alive, and I know you're very familiar with it, and you've, you're interested in, in, in Nando you're, is one of the guys, one of the survivors, and my guy that I was in touch with was Koche because he had a new book out about it. And um, they were these guys who took a plane to Chile, uh, so across Argentina from Uruguay to Chile, place I'm very familiar with, of course, because I lived in Argentina for seven years and visited Uruguay and Chile many times as well. Um, and... <laughs> Yeah, the plane hit a rock sticking out of the mountain and broke into two pieces at the top of a mountain. One piece slid back down the mountain and all the people there died because the back of the plane went into a very, um, like a soupy thick bit of snow and they asphyxiated in the snow. They, they were sort of stuck under the snow and they couldn't breathe down there. And they all, everybody who was in that bottom part of the plane died. That bottom part of the plane broke off one seat behind Koche. So he turned round, there was no one behind him anymore. His best mate was there, suddenly gone. Um, plane goes down the mountain, then the front part of it, that is, eventually crashes into the bottom. The pilots immediately die, squashed in there, and quite a few people die. All the seats are ripped forwards and smashed together at the front of the plane. I can't remember the, the the exact amounts, but I think 30 of them maybe survived from the whole plane. But a lot of them with things like broken legs and things like that, which, you know, if untreated over the weeks, they died of things like gangrene, horrible, horrible deaths. Thing was, they had no food um, at all. It was completely barren in the mountains except snow. The other thing was these guys had never, ever been in snow. They were used to a very temperate Uruguay climate. They're all wearing like, you know, shorts and T-shirts. They don't even have a jacket, uh, most of them. So that's insane to think about that because they're now caught in like minus 20 centigrade blizzards every single day, uh, minus 30 at night when a lot of them froze to death. That first night when they arrived there, uh, quite a few of them did freeze to death. Uh, Koche had to sort of cuddle up with another guy uh, for body heat 
to, to just survive the night just about managed to survive it then over the next days they managed to sort of block out some of the windows at least so it wasn't as cold but it must have been freezing i mean to think of that just in your t-shirt for months and blizzards and then they had to sort of think okay what are we going to do no food no water uh you can eat the snow of course but then you burn your mouth from the freezing cold of the snow uh so they had to put snow in wine bottles they had which is very uruguayan or argentine to have the wine bottles and all that they put snow in the wine bottles and put it out in the sun and it took hours and hours and they got a couple of drops of water a day from that you know which they had to share around and as for food after a few days they had to think you know what do we have what can we do all they had were the dead bodies of their friends uh, and family members and they had a big talk about it whether it was right whether it was wrong in this talk a lot of them said if i die next you can have my body that kind of thing uh, conversations, discussions that are just impossible to even imagine for for most of us. Um, and yeah, they were there eating each other's bodies. They couldn't even cook them. They didn't like them uh, or anything like that because they knew that um, heating the bodies would would um, would reduce the amount of meat very slightly. So they ate frozen parts of each other's bodies. Um, it's really quite awful. And they were there about three months. Uh, and I think about 17 of them survived at the end. Everybody had left them for dead. You know, the, nobody thought that they could have survived that long. Uh, it's very emotional talking to Kochi about that, especially when we get to the bit about his fiance and his mum finding out he was alive. That part, those parts of like, you know, they're always the, the really emotional bits. I found myself choking up while editing that. But he's a lovely man. And, you know, he's one of the few people on this earth who knows what human meat tastes like, you know, I, I, I didn't ask him that because I thought that would be a bit much uh, to ask, you know, an old man who's given up his time for me. But in terms of stories of human survival, I think that's probably the most fascinating one, bar none. And I, I'm so lucky I got to talk to him and have him on my podcast because it, it was a real honour. Yes. It's a story quite sort of, uh, I don't know what the expression is true to my heart because I flew that route. I've, I've, um, I've been in Uruguay and mm. I've sort of been to the museums to find out what I could about, about this story. And um, I've flown over the Andes into Chile for on, on that route, literally going over the, Oh, mm. all, all the places on route that are mentioned in, 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 in the book and the film. Oh, wow. And amazing. Yeah. I was, I was massively struck by Nando Parado's story, namely yeah. that he woke up from a coma after say three days to find out that while he'd been in a coma, his mother had died and he awoke to find that his sister had been alive but now, or, or been conscious, now she slipped into a coma and yeah. he had to watch her die. Yeah. And then after being up on that mountain or up, up in the mountain range for God knows, what was it, best part of a month or something? Yeah, um, three months. Th was it three three months? Oh, no, it was 72 days, I think, so two and a half months. Yeah. He just turned around to his crew and said, right, I'm going to walk out of here. And, That's of course, right. they said, well, you, you're, you're crazy. I mean, they had no equipment, no snowshoes, no skis, no nothing. Mm. Some of this snow is, is meters deep, literally. And he said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to walk out of here. And the last thing he said, I'll get really emotional when I think about this, is he, he as, as he set off, he said, oh, you know, if you need to eat my mum and my sister, you, yeah. you, you've got my permission. Um, oh. Just unbelievable and there were three of them that set off. One of them, they quickly realized he wasn't up to the challenge. So they made some excuse to send him back. But the two of them, I, I, mm. I forget the other gentleman's name. Um, yeah. They walked out of there. They walked yeah. for days through this thick snow, um, he heading west, I'm guessing, towards Chile. They had rugby socks because they're obviously a rugby team. They had rug rugby socks full of meat to keep them going. 
they were sleeping in a sleeping bag that they made out of the um the insulation from the fuselage of the of the plane yeah and um and yeah they they finally they got to a river and on the other side of the river were some gauchos so some cowboys and they threw a message across that they'd taped to a rock or, or tied to a rock and it said we come from the mountains our plane has crashed can you help and these gauchos were really suspicious because there was some kind of like rivalry in that area some like rebel action or something and they didn't know if these were the bad guys um but lo and behold the next day they um a helicopter turned up to to pick them up and what was uh moving again was one of the kids fathers just refused to give up on them even after three months he said no my son's still alive and and he kept the rescue he kept everything going you know the, the it just refused to accept that his son was dead and um could you and his son survived so could you imagine those two being re you reunited it's just beyond anything we can conceive isn't it yeah yeah well you just hope you know uh, this will never happen to most people i you know i've got to get a plane in a, in a week <laughs> to argentina actually going back off there and yeah it's always crossing my mind I, I i sometimes have a nightmare where i'm just placed in the middle of the ocean somewhere like completely in the middle and i'm just like looking around me you know and, and they had to go through it i think that's that is why again i had someone on my podcast called paul bloom who's a he was a former yale professor who's now at toronto along along with like jordan peterson there um he talks about why we sort of enjoy suffering we like to suffer in some ways uh for example we like a really hot bath we like really spicy food that kind of suffering as long as we know we're safe it's okay and for the same reason we like horror films uh and part of why we like horror films is because the brain he believes paul bloom believes is running like a practice software in our minds and it's going watch this horror film watch this zombie apocalypse because it's giving you training to what to do if you're in that situation so that's why that story has just kept our attention for so many years because it is the ultimate example, not only of just something extraordinary and, and horrible and awful, but also something where we all look at it and part of our minds is going, you know, thank God that's not me. And how did they survive? Might I have survived? And you're sort of almost practicing their survival as you watch it. So, and it's, and it's uplifting at the end, apart from, of course, for all the people who died, but it's uplifting that, that feeling that some people against all the odds survived. So. Yeah, really beautiful story, um, and I'm really yeah, proud of that that podcast episode. Mm. Have you have you had any awkward guests? Hmm. Yeah, I've had probably one, <laughs> one who was just a bit awkward. There's also been like one was a bit awkward, and I wouldn't want to say their name because it's not fair to them. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing my awkward guest in my mind and I've, I've never said their name, but... Go on, you say yours. <laughs> well, I had a guest and th there's this thing, right, that old school people that are used to doing TV interviews and the traditional mm -hmm. media, da, 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 da. When they come to a podcast, they've got this preconceived idea in their head of what it's going to be. They think sure. it's an interview essentially and they expect you to have like done all your research like you've read all their books you've got a whole team like you know on their history and of course like like you and i'm one guy i've got a family i've got loads and loads of work to do every day i i used to try and read my guest books and it got to the point where i i got 50 books on my shelf now mm -hmm. like it's impossible. just it's just ludicrous to yeah. expect that I can read all of my guest books, right? So what did they say? They were like, you didn't read my book, mate. Well, no, it wasn't like that. It was that they'd obviously taken a battering in the media over the years because something they did was mm -hmm. deemed like really bad. Basically that they'd left. Who people. was it? 
Oh, I can't. I'm not going to say, mate. I, 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 I can't. But they, <laughs> they, they basically they were accused of leaving people to die. Okay. And here's the thing: I didn't. I wasn't really like familiar with that. I had some vague thing about it, but I, I'm not. I'm not here to get people on my podcast to humiliate them. You know, or dig, no. dig the dirt. I, I, I just don't care about that. And what happened is towards the end of the podcast. I I mentioned someone that had died on on you know in 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 this person's life they they're an ad, we can say they're an adventurer right okay and it triggered them and I think they thought I was trying to like dish the dirt on them and it uh, wasn't like it, you were trying like you were trying to get at him yeah it, it 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 wasn't that it was just that when I'd done the research that I had done because obviously we we you know we do yeah, we yeah. do as much research as, as time allows us. One of the things I saw on the internet is that someone had died on one of their expeditions. Mm. Um, and I, towards the end of the podcast, so they, they, she, the, the, the person said, yeah, when we got to this bit, um, uh, it, 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 was, it was quite, you know, quite, quite amazing, blah, 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 blah. And I said, yeah, was it after that bit that so-and-so died? I just said it like that, Andrew, as, as, as you would if you're interested in someone's story. And I didn't realise that this person dying was another thing that had caused this person loads of controversy in their life. Oh, and yeah. they, it was almost like they turned on me in the podcast and, and, and it was just, it was that w- weird, weird, <laughs> weird moment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, the beauty of it is you can edit that out. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah well maybe it would have gotten more hits but you know you don't it, want that. it probably would but it, it would have embarrassed them yeah i i, I yeah, think yeah. Oh, I, I think it would have been i mean they literally went like a bit psycho into the camera no oh don't you don't want to go there you know i'm like fucking dude oh. chill the fuck out i i, I don't oh really give God. a shit to be honest i just was interested in your story um Jesus. you know Ah, well, it happens, man. It's not your fault. It just happens. But my thing was more like there was a woman, was a woman who was quite, I think, quite depressed, maybe, and she was d- dealing with a lot of stuff, and she was just a bit off the whole way through. And then afterwards, she kept saying like how she it was really bad, and she wished I'd told her that it was going to be a video as well. And I was just like, oh, sorry, I thought I did. And she was like, mm-hmm, you didn't, but I, you know, I did. And she. Um, then said, oh, I was so bad and stuff like that. And I was like, no, you were brilliant. And then she was like, can you stop patronizing me? I was like, oh, okay. Well, you weren't, you weren't brilliant then. Like, what do you want? Like, I'm just trying to be nice. But she's, she was going through her own stuff, you know? Yeah. We had one situation again, I won't say the name, but the guest was very honest that during the lockdown, they'd been drinking more. Right. Right. Well, most people I know have had drug or alcohol problems. There's one time in my life I didn't know anyone that didn't didn't take drugs or alcohol, right? Yeah. Anyone who lives lived through the the nineties and and lived the sort of life will 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 just know what I mean. And yeah. And lots of us have run into challenges with it. I'm not going to say problems. I'm going to say challenges because all of life is experiences, and it's what. It, it, it's what you do with those experiences that count. And, and if you don't have harsh experiences, mm. you have nothing with which to learn from, to develop yourself as a human being. You have nothing to go, you know, it, it, Absolutely. It, it's why people join elite military forces. It's why people jump out of airplanes. It's why people climb mountains without supplementary oxygen. It's, it's that mm. in itself is a massive experience it's just some of us also did stuff through uh you know messing around with substances yeah. and this particular get so what i'm trying to say andrew is i i welcome any on- honest conversation about that when yeah. i was young none of that was talked about yeah horrible names were assigned to people that had challenges with addiction and, and still are by by many people today lots of stigmatizing kind of stuff going on and as such what this does is it drives people who've got mental health problems such as addiction. It drives them underground 
it means that they are hesitant to come and talk about it because they think, you know, the the not so bright people or not so educated people are going to judge them by it. Right. Yeah. Whereas yeah. most people know, actually, you know, most people are actually quite nice and they care for you. And, and yeah. the ones that don't, they're the ones that have got issues in their life. It's not about you. It's about they, they've got issues in their life and they're projecting them onto you by calling you names or whatever. And so in this conversation, it came out that the person had been drinking a lot during lockdown. Mm -hmm. And it was a great, honest conversation to have because they were a celebrity. And, and well, how many people realized they had a drinking problem during lockdown? I'm, I'm guessing in this country, hundreds of thousands, if, if not an even higher, higher figure. And it was just upsetting that what happened is, is the mainstream media picked up on this podcast mm. and oh. what my ideal scenario, Andrew would have been for my guests to go. Yeah. Well, that's the mainstream media. Their, their job is to destroy people's lives. Uh, we don't buy into that horse shit. That's why we don't watch it. And we don't buy buy their crappy newspapers. Yeah. And just think how many people uh, learned from the chat I had with Chris and we followed yeah. it up by, you know, we're given some words of advice and this kind of stuff. But of course, like I say, when you get people that have been schooled in the traditional methods of media, so BBC interview, very structured, very rigid, you know, mm -hmm. interview in the paper, blah, 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 blah. They, they, they're very affected by that. Um, yeah. And, What can I say? It was just a shame that the wonderful conversation we had about a very difficult subject that probably helped an enormous amount of people that my guests thought it was something to be ashamed of. Um, That's a real shame. And, that is a shame. And, uh, and I felt bad for the guests because it was one of those ones where, like, we could have edited it out. Oh, they could have kind of... ask you to, did he? No, they didn't ask me to, which wasn't the point. It was more that when you get into these conversations, you can fall into that false sense of security, can't you? I'm chatting to you now. What if I, and we're going to come on to this, by the way, but what if I told you one of my deep, dark secrets because you're a good guy and I, you right. know, I like you and I, I go a bit step too far and the next thing, the next thing well. I know. Well, then I think that's the responsibility of the person, unfortunately. I don't think that's you at all. They said it, and you're right. Like, it could be because you're a good interviewer, there's something nice about you, and, and because of that, you are, you know, people reveal stuff to you. That's what makes you a good journalist. But at the end of the day, it sounds like you're very willing if somebody says, listen, afterwards, that thing I said earlier, could you take that out, you know? And if they don't do that, then if they, they have no right to be annoyed at you, not, not in the slightest. Well, they know it's recorded. Yeah. I, I get it though, Andrew. I get all of it. I get, I'm not, I'm old now. I, I get all of life. I know why everyone reacts in the way that they, sure. they do. Doesn't mean I, they're right though. No, no, no. But I get that when you're ego driven, which celebrities are, unfortunately, you know, they're, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. they're, 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 they're not spiritually enlightened. Spiritually enlightened would person would go press write what you like about me. It's literally, yeah. it's literally not going to affect me, my life or what I do tomorrow because it's irrelevant. And I take my power from a, you know, from a much yeah. higher source. Well, they say it's not Chris's fault. The science of secrets. This is a book that you've got coming out. Have, have you finished mm. writing it yet? Haven't even started, but I'm already talking about it all the time. I've actually got a meeting later today, <coughs> sorry, with uh, with the publisher, um, but it's a big publisher, and it's it, it doesn't have a name yet, so I call it you know the science of secrets. We we haven't thought of the name, uh, but I'm so excited that you know I've actually got an offer from a, a publisher. You know, it's this this it might not even happen, you know. So, but hopefully it is. I've started researching it loads. Just it, it's basically 
since I started doing the podcast, you know, I talked before about parasocial interaction, this, this concept that people trust you, people think of you as a friend, the way I, you know, I think of a talk show host as a friend. And because of that, they often reveal their secrets to you. And that's the mark of a good journalist. It's like there's something about them. You want to reveal your secrets to them. And so I started getting some stuff like one person in particular got in touch and told me that they had killed someone. Uh, and this was a woman who told me that she at once killed a guy uh, with her hands. She told me all about it and all to, you know, and it all checks out. And I was just like, wow, what an amazing story, awful, horrible, weird. But also, why me? Why did you tell me? What was it about something I'd done or said that made you want to get in touch and tell me this? Who else gets told secrets all the time? What kinds of people? Uh, another got in touch on Instagram, a woman to tell me that. Uh, you know, she was in her 60s and her marriage wasn't going very well. And she had been exchanging naked photos with a 30 year old singer who, in my mind, was just trying to get money out of her. And so all these different worlds kept opening up to me for no reason, apparently. So that got me really interested in the secrets. That's how I start the book with these, like I go into the details of some of the stories these people tell me. Then I was really interested in like, what do people do at home? There's so much shame about certain things that we do, let's say sexually, for example, or even just like nose picking, right? Nose picking is a fun one because it's like, it's not as like, oh, sex or taboo like that. But it is something that if you're seen doing uh, in public, you'll get so much disgust from people. Like people will be revulsed. You'll be like kicked out of society because it's such a disgusting thing to be seen to be doing, at least in our society. Uh, so I did some it's, of these. Um, you don't. You don't want to get caught eating it. That's what I'd say. Oh, that's particularly. That's too far. Yeah. I put it. them behind my ear and I wait. Wait till no. Definitely wait till no one's looking. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's the thing. And then I did. A, I did some surveys. I got some of my listeners, a few hundred, to do some surveys. You know, do you pick your nose a lot? Well, almost all of them do, right? So why do we have a thing that we're so disgusted about people doing and we put so much shame? I'm not suggesting that I want to have a society where everybody's out picking their nose in public, but w I think it's an example of the ways that we shame people around us for doing what we all do at home. Can I, can I just add something? Sorry to interrupt, but look mm. at the primates in the jungle, the monkeys. What do they do? Mm. Pick their nose and eat it all day long, don't they? Look, yeah. at, look at a child. What's a child do? They pick exactly. it and they look around and when they think then so quite clearly it's a human it, it exactly it it's something about I don't know if it's getting nutrients in because I'd imagine that your snot <laughs> probably I think snot Maybe. is probably a lot of toxins coming oh. out the body, so yeah. it's probably not a good idea to eat it, but but also dust and stuff coming into the body. Mm. So maybe yes. there's nutrients in that. I don't know. We'd need a scientist for that. But but the point being, like you know, let's not be so ashamed of a lot of the things we do. And there's there's talk about female masturbation as well. It's sort of a, a known thing that men do it nearly every day, and that's what my survey showed. But I didn't realize how often women do, according to my survey. Anyway, it was often, uh, including ones in relationships. Which I, so I think a lot of boyfriends will be very surprised. You know, still quite a few days a week, or at least a few times a month. Which and and why is that more taboo for women? You know, I very rarely do women. Mm, what? I'm not, I'm not that lucky. <laughs> no, I'm not talking no, about you no. doing women. I'm talking about them doing themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know it, it's those kinds of things there's a lot of taboo around women masturbating right whereas men it's like ha 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 it's a joke and we're all having a laugh why is that so i'm looking at those kinds of secrets and like what the difference between secrecy and privacy is uh what the difference between secrecy and deception is right there's all these different overlapping themes um and I look at who we reveal stuff to, not polite people, for example. Polite people are not who we want to reveal stuff to. And I think the reason for that is if you look at history, you look at like the Nazis, you look at this, the, the SS, they were very polite and they were all about sticking to rigid forms of societal politeness. And that meant dobbing on your neighbor, right? So you can't always trust people who are polite. We tend to trust people who are a little bit more subversive, a little bit more controversial and a bit unhinged you know because you think they'd go out on a limb to protect me in a way that a polite person might just sort of dob you in so that kind of stuff really interested me and then i wanted to know what happens 
if you keep secrets, what happens to you? And each of us keeps on average 13 secrets at any one time. Um, and and I think it's like 97% of us keep at least one secret. So we're always keep, even if you don't think you are, if you really think about it, you are. And the more secrets you keep, the worse it is for your mental and then physical health. It can lead to things like ulcers. There's even some evidence it can lead to things like cancer. If you're keeping a lot of secrets, it's the stress and the rumination in your mind about the secret. So I thought, can I find the worst possible secrets to keep? And studies suggest the worst secrets you can keep would be something involving your identity, so something so intrinsic to you, and something that, if revealed, would lead to you being ostracized. So if you think back to like um, Turin, uh, Alan Turing, sorry, um, he he was having to keep an identity secret that he was gay, and if it were revealed, it would mean very bad things for him. That must have been outrageously stressful, incredibly difficult, and probably you know that might have led. Well, that did lead ultimately to his suicide, right? And some people say it wasn't suicide. Um, and, and as also the chemical castration he was going through was awful. But then nowadays in our society, okay, gay is okay, mostly accepted and it sh as it should be. So, so what is the worst secret you can keep? Well, it's those people who I won't name on YouTube who have, uh, you know, an inclination, predilections, a predilection towards. Mm young people and so they are the people who are keeping something about their identity an awful horrible thing secret in the knowledge that if that were to come out they would be killed ostracized put in prison beaten up by you know i'm not talking about the ones who offend i'm talking about ones who keep it their whole lives inside they never act on it but they're living with a very difficult secret. Whether or not you feel sorry for them is a very, very different thing. You don't have, you know, I'm not going to tell people to feel sorry for those people. But what I do know is that they will be going through an extraordinary amount of stress. Um, so I went and met some, and I wanted to do something a bit different to the normal. By the way, you can find episode six of my podcast, On the Edge with Andrew Gold. I do have an interview with one of these guys. He's an 18-year-old head boy of his school or class president of his school and he has those feelings and we talk about it and i i think that's unusual on youtube because usually people don't want to have that because of the advertising and stuff like that i didn't get his face it's just audio uh but it was fascinating to sit and talk to him uh, and see what kind of cognitive biases he has because he does have many and i tried to sort of debate with him about that could you um, could you give yeah. us an, an example of one of his cognitive biases Mm -hmm. Well, he told me uh, that he would never offend. He would never touch those, you know, because he knows it's not right. He knows it's bad to do, but he needs to be around children. And as the head boy of his school, he always goes to these like after school classes to be around them. And, you know, he loves just hanging out with them. And I said, and he said, he said, if I were made to not be with them, I'd be more likely to offend and I said, well, hang on, if you're not around them, you can't offend. And he said, no, you don't get it. Like, I have to be near them. That stops me offending. And I was like, hmm, this is a cognitive bias. And I was saying, can you see this is a cognitive bias of yours? Because you want to be around them. So you're telling yourself it's better for everyone if you're around them. It's better for everyone, really, if you are never around them. It's not right that parents are sending their kids somewhere and that you're getting some attraction to them. Um and he wouldn't have it. And he seemed like, you know, he was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to be a nice guy. He knows, he knows, he said, I know it's the worst thing that can happen to a kid. So I would never do that to them. I love them so much. I, I would never hurt them and all this stuff. And I, I was saying, I think you need to look at yourself and go like, you know, it, time, time to put some distance between them. And he was just going, no, that will make me more likely to offend. So mm. that's a cognitive bias that I couldn't shake for, of, of his. But for the book, I went and met um, a woman because I wanted to do something different. So I met a 25-year-old woman, very, very rare, and even more taboo because we like to associate them with like the maternal love, rightly or wrongly. I don't know if that's fair, but that's how we associate them. So for her to come out, if she were to ever tell anybody about her life, I went and met her in a tiny village in Germany somewhere, spent the day with her, just talking to her about it. Again, she said, I've never, ever offended, never would, but uh, I have these you know, uh, inclinations. I have these desires and I, I can't have an adult relationship. 
which which I found quite sad and 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 creepy and revolting and but also it, your mind just goes it was a very s- scary surreal moment hanging out with her but yeah I met all these people I met uh, a therapy I went to a therapy clinic uh, in Germany because I was living in Berlin for a while and they've got the world's only therapy clinic that never reports these people to authorities um and that's really controversial because on the one side it works because it means that these people actually go to get therapy right before they offend it stops offending like isn't that fantastic the other hand is it means doctors are sitting with these people knowing what they might be capable of and saying okay well goodbye come back next time go back onto the streets and potentially to offend again so you, you say to, offend again but you said they hadn't offended oh right right you're right yeah they, yeah they, these ones generally haven't offended but even if they have I think the therapy is not able to report them. And yeah, it's a whole it, it's a whatever the expression is bag of worms or something, isn't it? The whole can of worms yeah. cuz I mean it, if you have someone that has let's just call it the feelings, right? But mm-hmm. they have they know that it's 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 not right. Mhm. And moreover, if they carry them out, that they are, um, the word is defiling. You're defiling a young person, aren't you? You know? Yeah. I.e., you're, they're files in their brain. You are corrupting by telling them that this is normal behavior, right? So if a person has the feelings, but they never would carry them, uh, is it wrong if I say I wouldn't give a shit? That's, I'm sure there's fucking loads of people like that. There's, it's a rich tapestry of life, isn't it? Um, I think most most people share your view when you sit and talk to them. The problem is there are some people who who don't, and they're very angry, and they put a lot of YouTube comments and like. And, and sometimes you wonder if it's a little bit of you know the the lady doth protest too much or whatever. That thing of you know for for, for many many years there's a lot of religious people who hated gay people and often were outed themselves as being gay. Uh, and I, I wonder, a lot of the hunters of these people have turned out to be these people themselves. Mm-hmm. That's not the case for all of them. That's not me suggesting that anybody who disagrees with what you've just said, which I agree with, which is that as long as they don't offend, I actually feel a bit sorry for well, them. Can I, can I just come in there just to clarify what I mean is, you, there's fuck all we can do about it. I mean, if someone's, if for whatever reason someone the product of that person's life has has produced an adult with these feet, there's nothing you or I can do about. It. I mean, what we're going to do? Lock up every single. This, yeah. That's probably. And there's always more. There's always more coming out because this. I saw Louis C.K. do a comedian a skit about this recently. Uh, he's got a new tour, the comedian, and he was saying as well. He's like he said exactly what you said. What are we going to lock, lock them up? It's not like okay, now we've got them all and that's it because there are always more being produced. So the yeah. only thing you can do that this German therapy is trying to do is say, okay, there's nothing we can do about that. Let's try and get them in for therapy so that they understand how bad it is to offend and how much it does in a child's life. Sorry, just to be clear, for people at home who might be confused, we're, we're not defending um, no. uh, uh, crimes against people here. We, we, we're saying that if 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 today... Uh, uh, one of those armed security vans drives by me, you know, the ones that take the money to the bank. Hmm. Right? If I see one and briefly in my mind, I think, whoa, imagine <laughs> if I robbed it. Imagine if I'm like, right, give us the money. And then next thing I'm sat at home and I've got these bags upon bags of, right. I'm not going to do that. Does it mean I'd do it if I could get away with it? Yeah. I mean, not, not now in my life. Cause I'm old and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've learned by the error of my ways and I've learned that money won't, wouldn't, wouldn't make me happy. But, but mm. does it, does that mean that no one's ever allowed to have that thought and they've, they've all got to go to prison? Well, that would be ridiculous. That, that would be, we'd have to, you'd have to lock the whole country up. Cause I'm sure everyone has, yeah. you know, some thought about, I mean, imagine when someone's rude to you and you just want to like yeah. bloody want to kill them. We don't punish people for their thoughts. Yeah, we, we don't, we don't punish people. You just said you wanted to kill him. I mean, you, you don't put people in prison for that. No. Um, 
for their so it's forces. a weird one. I, I, I yeah. Their fantasies yeah. as well. I mean, there's there's some evidence that there are some women who have fantasies about being raped, right? Um, that is very rarely the case that they actually want to be, right? It's like a fantasy. And the reason the fantasy is okay is because they're actually in control of it in their fantasy. In real life, it's one of the worst things, maybe the worst thing that can ever happen to a woman. Um, there are plenty of fantasies that most people have. And that's partly what this book I'm going to write is about, Um that we do have horrible fantasies. We and and I think it, we're only going to give ourselves a lot of guilt if we try to want ourselves to have perfect fantasies because we can't control them. So it might not be. I think it's only one percent of the population have you know the, what we were talking about before with the children stuff. Um, so that's very small, right? But the the other ninety nine percent of us, it's not like we don't have weird fantasies, even if it's stuff you've seen the stuff that's available on you know those websites. It's it's like like I've seen weird stuff, like, you know, from cartoons to little. It doesn't mean you want those things to actually happen. You don't really want to go to bed with Fred Flintstone. So we mustn't punish people for their thoughts and fantasies or make them feel too much guilt about it obviously that one percent i'm talking about the ones who are attracted to children and that that, that is a really really complicated and scary topic because mm. you don't want to leave even if it is just fantasies i still don't like the idea of them fantasizing about my kids if you, do you know what i mean so that's where it's awkward yes it's it, it kind of is but again it's just that thing and nothing we could do about it i mean Sure. Well, you can, you can prevent them from like babysitting your children if you knew about it. Cause I went, I went and met one guy who was babysitting children and I was like, and I arrived and he had the kids with him and I went, what are you doing? And he goes, Oh, well I babysit these kids. And I go, you're a, this, you know, this word. I said, you're that, you're that. And he was, he was German. He's going, yeah, well, well, you know, I'm not going to do anything. I'm like, yeah, but you shouldn't be babysitting these children. Where's the mum? I went and met the mum. I said, do you know about this? She goes, yeah, but I trust him. I'm like, he's taking your kids swimming. He's getting off on it. And she's like, yeah, but they don't know. And he's not doing anything to them. It was, to me, that's bonkers. So that's where I draw the line with the, okay, fantasies or whatever. Nah, I wouldn't let my kids be babysat by this guy. Yeah, it's, I'm just playing devil's advocate here. But yeah. if, if you loved custard pies... <laughs> But but you yeah. understand that like you're supposed to pay for them. Does that mean you're never allowed to work in a custard pie shop? You, I, okay, yeah. it's a, it, it's a very silly example. <clears throat> I, I know the pies don't have. If you're an you alcoholic, know. I would I wouldn't suggest you work behind a bar. Well, I've done that, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was yeah. an interesting part of my life. Um, well, you see, you see what I mean. That's a more serious. So the custard pie ones I get, but when it's more serious, I think like the alcohol one. I would say don't work behind a bar. So if you have those inclinations towards children, you shouldn't be babysitting them. That's my view. Yeah, I. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those ones, isn't it? Where I don't think anything's ever going to be clean cut. There, there's there's too many. There's so many inputs here: psychological, sociological, biological, cultural. Yeah, that's what, yeah. That's uh, why it fascinates me so much. Yeah, community to to say one thing fits everything is is. Mm. It's it, it it yeah it's a funny one. I mean, for example, you know, if I love women, and maybe I fancy your your girlfriend, does does that mean I we you wouldn't have me in your house for dinner, even though you know that say Chris is a good guy, he's never going to do anything. Do, yeah, well, do, well, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't mind having you for dinner, but that let's say in this hypothetical example, maybe I would feel awkward if I knew you fancied her about you going out for dinner just with her, right? And and that's still different because she's got well, much more ability to say no still, and I would expect her to say no. Yeah. Whereas if it's a child, they don't know to say no. They don't that's understand what, That's happening. why we've been hiding it from you, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's a, <laughs> mate, it's great that you're brave enough to, to look into these areas because, Thank you. you know, just, just charging everyone with, you know, calling everyone names and then wanting to hang everyone. That's just never going to help anything, is it? We've got, we, we need to. Be- well, it makes things worse. And that's one of the things the doctors at this German clinic said to me. They said one of the main risks, there's, there's three risk factors for these people. One is being around children, right? That's what um, 
that's that's what we were saying about this guy with biases before. He was saying he should be around them. I know for a fact that the doctors have said, no, you shouldn't. But that's the main risk factor that will make you offend. You're around them. Stop it. Second is being on drugs or alcohol because you lose your inhibitions, right? You don't mm. you stop thinking about what's right for the kid and you just do what you want to do. The third one is ostracization. Um, if you're ostr if you feel, and this this is true of any walk of life, if you feel like you're being excluded, that people have given up on you and that people think you're a monster, you have less desire, less motivation to do what's right by society. So you, you take a, somebody who did, you know, who murdered or something or like that, and he wants to rehabilitate or whatever, but everyone's going, you're a monster. Eventually he's just going to go, well, screw it. You think I'm a monster? I'm a monster then. I don't need to get better. I'm just going to do the crime again. Same thing goes for these guys. If they're told like, hey, we want you to be better. We want you to go to therapy. We're going to help you. Uh, we want you to be a decent member of our society. You're a human being who has this terrible affliction and we're going to stop, you know, we're going to teach you the ways. They'll be like, okay, uh, not all of them, of course, but some of them will be like, okay, I'm on board. If you just say to them outside the clinic that I'm talking about, there's graffiti saying, hang the these people, you know, uh, they're walking past that when they go to therapy. It's not going to help. And it might yeah. make the person who wrote the graffiti feel good, but it's not going to make some someone else. It could be there, you know. If that that guy goes, you know what? Screw it. I've seen the graffiti. I feel really bad now. I am going to offend now. Well, that person who's done the graffiti is partially responsible for what might happen to a kid now. Mm. I, I just, I don't, I don't really mean they're that responsible for it. I just mean it doesn't help. Like having a go, just go. And, and basically, what we're saying is, I'm having a go at them because I'm not one of them. Everyone, everyone, look, I'm not one of them. I'm saying you're bastards, this, you're this, you're that. This comes back to the virtue signaling thing again, isn't it? Yeah. Is you, yeah. It's, it's like the prison, you know, I've, I've robbed old ladies' houses and stolen their, you know, their late husband's possessions, all that they had to remember. But at least I don't, you know, at least I haven't done that. It, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's that I'm I'm above on the food chain because I haven't done that thing. Yeah. We, I, I think it, this clinic has said that they they really do believe. Like, look, it's an awful thing, but you got to we got to get them into therapy because it could be your kids thereafter, right? Let's get them into therapy. It's the only thing that we can do mm. so they realize how awful it is. And I met so many people who had been abused as children, and like, it's the worst. It, it and there'll be people watching this who have been through it, and they'll know. And they might be triggered by hearing it, and I respect that, and I understand that. But it, it's the worst thing that can happen. It's the worst thing that can happen to a kid. So we've got to do something about it. We can't just sit here and just keep going. Oh, they're bad people, and make ourselves feel good. Yeah, we you we know? also need to, as a society, be asking what is creating this. You know, what is creating this imbalance? Mm. Oh well, that's uh, another hour, isn't it? We could. Talk yeah, about let's not go there now. <laughs> but of course, but I mean. I mean, it, it seems quite obvious, I would say, that if you go to public school, mm. uh, i.e. private school or, or bo boarding school, mm. and these these lads are having these, you know, their first experiences at a very, very young age, mm. I'm not saying everybody now, of course I'm not, but it does seem that when you look at our politicians, many of whom went to these kind of schools, and then you see some of the the, the um, deviancy that they're involved in. That you, 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 th these are all questions we need to be asking. You know what what um, what is what is creating unhealthy ad you know un mm -hmm. unhealthy adults. The, there does seem to be a correlation between people who had very bad, and I'm saying seem it seems because there's just not been enough work and studies done on these people because they're so secretive. They don't want to come forward and do a study. It's very hard. But just from my own anecdotal experience, most of these people had awful childhoods, whether that be being in a boarding school where something happened to them as a kid, you know, so it's a cycle like that. But also it can just be, I mean, look at Michael Jackson. And again, like, I, I don't know exactly what happened there, but I do know he had an awful childhood where he was beaten and attacked and all that kind of thing. And there does seem to be some suggestion that you can sometimes get, your sexuality can get stuck at the age at which you were abused. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard that. And, and also... Andrew, I think there's areas of our mind that we still haven't got our heads around. Yeah. Um, and by that, I mean, 
I think as humans, we can have impulses, urges and, and, and feelings in, in a moment that, oh, my God, we, we bloody would hide that from the rest of the world because it, 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 it's, it's just a very dark side of the human personality. Nice. Um, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, the fact that someone can go out in cold blood and murder someone, that, that's a fascinating oh, yeah. a- area just in itself. Yeah. Um, oh, I agree. And yes, the, just as we finish off, mate, I just wanted to go back to this parasocial mm-hmm. interaction. Um, what do you call it in? Interaction, parasocial interaction. interaction. Is this when you get your your game show, uh, your talk show host, and he's saying, "Okay, folks. So today in New York, we have seen this person mm-hmm. saying this. Now, I don't know about you, but when what they're really saying is, I know exactly what you think because I know <laughs> the I know the demographic I'm dealing with and how easily brainwashed you've all been by <laughs> by TV all your life." Uh, yeah. I don't know about you, but I would say this guy's a fucking joker. And <laughs> yeah. Is it that kind of conversation? It's, it's a one-sided conversation. The other yeah. thing is when people say, um, so the question is, or, or so or what people are, and, and it's like, hang on, well, no, no one's asked that. You've, you've hypothetically <laughs> raised a question and then you're answering it. Yeah, it's constantly, you're right. It's constantly acting out. Uh, as though there were a two way so they're going and so the question is because there's no second person actually answering the question asking the question they're doing both sides of the conversation in a sense it's it's acting out it's it's acting out authenticity it's it's saying i'm having an authentic relationship with you the viewer and you can look right into the camera lens i'm having a, an authentic relationship with you you are my friend but it's only ever one way it does leave the other person though always wanting a bit more and always wanting to 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 reveal secrets to that person to to the talk show host and to to subscribe to their stuff and be their friend and that kind of thing yeah but also if you know everyone's been i i think in life everyone's been traumatized right mm. some of us more than others some of us it's childhood stuff that really wasn't very you know very pleasant Mm. But I think everybody, by nature of the, the society we live in, and that we're all controlled by, I, I, I'm not going to say the word because I keep getting demonetized, but, well, actually, I'm, we've said it a lot already, but I think these psychopathic trillionaires have got a lot to answer for. Um, I yeah, actually sure. do think they sit around a table and plan all this, uh, you know, this shit and i think that their mo is to destroy the individual from birth like literally to cut them off from any form of spirituality give them like false religion stuff that that is just a um what's that word like a confusion you know it takes them takes them all through the woods and yeah. round the houses um i think the the media is used to just destroy all people's self-confidence with these beauty magazines and these men's magazines and, you know, and all, all, all this kind of stuff. And, um, and so when you're talking to camera, everyone you're talking to, to a degree has been through this process. So if you oh. say, guys, I don't know about you, but these beauty magazines, like as if all guys look like that, What's wrong with being, you know, a bit tubby around the middle, right? Suddenly, everyone can relate to that, can't they? Yeah, everyone's going. People to relate. I agree. Listen, I've got, I've got a head off in a minute because I don't know. Otherwise, I won't be able to get lunch. Andrew, no worries. I'm going to love you and leave you, brother. You've been absolutely brilliant. Fascinating chat. Let Let's do this again. Yeah. um, As soon as possible. I've loved it, mate. It's been so nice. Thank you. And. Uh, before we go, we're just going to say, folks, if you can um, get onto Andrew's podcast, On the Edge. Oh, yeah. On the Edge with Andrew Gold on YouTube or Spotify or uh, Apple and all that stuff. Hey, you sound like the radio DJ then. Hey. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, baby. Let's hit it. 
get it on do the Andrew thing. don't um don't stay online uh, uh, unless there's anything you wanted yeah. to particularly- oh I do want to ask you one thing once we stop recording okay in that case massive thanks again Andrew I really enjoyed this chat I think it's been really Thank productive you. to our friends at home big love to you all please look after yourselves if you can like and make sure you're subscribed because YouTube I don't know why they unscribe un unsubscribe so many people from my channel um, I think uh, channel. sometimes the truth is a bit close to the whatever it, it's supposed yeah. to be close to should we um, subscribe to each other's channels Chris yes I'm subscribing to you now and there you go we'll see you all soon bye bye see you soon